We are going to take a journey together, a journey with my friend Suki here to Mars. I'm going to show you how robotics will allow humans to live on other worlds, and what the University of New Mexico and NASA are doing to make that a reality. Humans have always been explorers. Throughout our long history, we have suffered harsh conditions and terrible dangers just to make it over the next horizon. Ever since we spread out of Africa, we've explored the coldest mountaintops and the deepest oceans, and along the way made wonderful discoveries, scientific discoveries about our place in the universe, technological discoveries that shape our modern world, and personal discoveries about the limits of what we can achieve. But it's not just our natural urge to explore that drives us into space. There are practical reasons. The aptly named rare earth elements that are essential to make your cell phones work, for wind turbines, are difficult and destructive to mine on this planet, but they're abundant throughout the solar system. We've already made the first few steps on that next stage of our journey. We have permanent dwellings 250 miles above the Earth's surface. We've visited the moon 240,000 miles away. And NASA is currently operating under a presidential order to have a human mission to Mars by 2033. That's only 15 years away. You in the audience, or certainly the children you know, could be on those first missions. But Mars is, 240, is 140 million miles away, 500 times the distance between Earth and the Moon. Each and every day, we need to consume kilograms of oxygen and water just to stay alive. So the idea of keeping astronauts alive away from the Earth for months or years is daunting. But it's not so daunting for my friend Suki here. Suki has robots that have been working on Mars for decades, successfully. All they need is a power source, such as the sun. So I want you to imagine a day in 2030 when Suki or one of her descendants blasts off from Kennedy Space Center and travels that 140 million miles, or six months, to Mars, and lands perhaps somewhere like this. This is Gale Crater. It's an environment of extremes, 195 below zero during the winter, but a balmy 75 degrees on a summer day. Gale Crater is a dry lake bed, but we now know that there was frozen water ice beneath the surface of Mars. And it's that water ice that Suki is going to look for. But while Suki begins exploring her environment, another robot begins work at the landing site. This is a 3D printer standing 12 feet tall. It takes up the Martian soil itself, mixes it with a little bit of plastic, and can 3D print an entire building. So when humans do arrive on Mars, they already have a place to live, using only the resources that were already there on Mars. But humans need much more than a place to live. They need that oxygen, and they need that water to drink, but far more, they also need tons of hydrogen. Because if you mix oxygen and hydrogen, you have rocket fuel. So astronauts arriving on Mars could use that oxygen and hydrogen to get back home. If we were to try and take all the tons of resources with us that astronauts need on Mars for extended missions, it would cost more than the entire annual budget of NASA. If we're going to be anything more than tourists and other worlds, we have to be able to live off the land. We have to be able to use the resources that are already on other planets and moons. The Opportunity rover has been on Mars for a while, and it has the record for the longest distance traveled, 26 miles. But because Opportunity was piloted from Earth, where a signal takes an hour to reach Mars and return, it took eight years for Opportunity to cover those 26 miles. 
for robots to be effective in gathering resources on Mars, they have to be able to think for themselves. They have to be intelligent, and they have to work in a team. So we've designed these robots at the University of New Mexico to do just that. Suki here is number one, but she is just one of a hundred robots just like her that we've already created. We've patterned the behavior of these robots after desert harvester ants. These are ants that live around New Mexico. I'm sure you've all seen them as you're walking outside. They are perfectly adapted at finding the seeds they eat, communicating about their locations, and bringing them back to a central location. So working with her friends, Suki and these other robots finally detect water ice just a few inches under the surface, and they bring in the mining robots. This is Razor. Razor is designed to be a lightweight mining robot with counter-rotating drums, so it's able to dig down through the surface of Mars and scoop up that water-laden soil. It stores the soil in these drums and is able to transport it back to a car-sized processing facility that we've already tested at Kennedy Space Center. Putting the water ice in this machine, it'll extract hydrogen and oxygen and give us that fuel we need. So we can imagine that when humans finally do reach Mars in 2033, rather than scrabbling to survive on the resources they're able to find there or have taken with them, they'll have stockpiles of everything they need. They'll be able to perform scientific experiments, explore, even send selfies back over the deep space network to Earth. And when they finally leave, they'll have proven that we can survive on other worlds long term. Suki, of course, and the other robots will remain on Mars. They'll keep on their work, preparing for the next manned mission. But this opens the door far beyond Mars because the solar system is full of places with frozen water ice. And we can send robots to all those places and allow ourselves to call those places home as well. Chris Hadfield, who is the commander of the International Space Station, put it most beautifully, I think, when he wrote, what a moment of introspection for mankind. If you are the person who discovers that first fossilized flower on Mars. How that would change our perception of our place in the universe. But even though the robotics revolution will certainly allow this to happen eventually, we need roboticists to give these robots life. We need roboticists to teach these robots how to think for themselves, how to work in teams, and how to solve these difficult tasks. So we've worked over the last three years with more than a thousand students from 40 different universities, teaching them the skills in robotics they need to join us on this journey. But we have a lot further to go. We have a lot of work to do over the next 10, 15 years. And I implore you, if you are interested in science and technology, to join us on this journey. We could discover wonderful things together. So I hope you'll Join the swarm.